And so I'm particularly pleased to welcome Paul Gray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ken, for that uh, generous introduction, and thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, give this talk. Uh, I found it uh, fun and actually enlightening to sort of step back and think about my career in ways that I, I hadn't uh, before. I mean, one of the things that struck me was uh, having thought of myself to a certain extent as a, an ivory tower scholar, uh, just that how much at different points in my career it was influenced by what was going on uh, in society uh, around me. Uh, well, uh, you know, speaking of criminology, you know, the study of the Soviet Union had its own uh, special challenges uh, because of the high level uh, of secrecy, uh, and scholars devised various techniques. Uh, which was sometimes lampooned a bit by being called Kremlinology, trying to figure out what was going on uh, in the Kremlin. I think it was Winston Churchill who said that trying to figure out uh, the political battles uh, in Russia was like observing uh, a brawl under a rug. Uh, you can tell from the grunts and from the changing shapes that something was going on, uh, but it was hard to tell who was doing what uh, to whom. And I think one difference between uh, criminology and the academic world is, in the academic world, sometimes it's all too obvious who's doing what uh, to whom. Well, it, it's uh, a delight to see so many friends here and to see uh, so many people I know uh, well from the Emeritus College and also to see some people who uh, I'm acquainted with uh, but don't know so well uh, from the Emeritus College. I, I'm guessing that some of you are here out of curiosity to find out more of my background uh, and just what prepared me for my present career peddling insurance uh, for the nurse <laughs> and the So I hope that uh, the talk will uh, be uh, of some assistance uh, in that. Well, I'll jump a little bit out of chronological sequence and I just want to uh, express uh, really my uh, very deep and heartfelt uh, thanks uh, and gratitude to my colleagues in the political science department, a number of whom are here. I mean, these are people I've known for 40, and in some cases almost 50 years, as much as saying that uh, uh, is, is a bit of a shock almost to myself. Uh, we all know that uh, university career is a bit of a, a lottery. You don't know where you're going to wind up. Uh, you don't know what uh, kind of department you're going to find yourself in. Uh, when I arrived back in 1971, uh, what I found was a department uh, that was very strongly committed to democratic principles. Uh, that it was one of the first units at UBC uh, which had waged battle with the administration and secured uh, the right to appoint its own heads and to appoint these heads for a limited term. This was still a time when people were appointing uh, for indefinite terms or even uh, life. And the department insisted uh, upon this, and it was very much committed uh, to democratic principles. Uh, the head when I arrived was uh, Walter Young, a distinguished scholar of Canadian politics, uh, but also a person of very strong democratic principles. And in fact, he's uh, remembered fondly by some of us for having waged a somewhat quixotic uh, struggle for a number of years, a campaign on behalf of trying to abolish academic rank. He felt that we should all be professors and that uh, it, uh, we shouldn't have assistant, associate, and full professors. Now, of course, here he was battling the academic culture of uh, at North America and beyond, uh, and he didn't get very far, uh, but it was a sign of his commitment uh, to principle. And I always felt, and I was really quite uh, appreciative of the fact when I arrived, I felt as a starting assistant professor, uh, that there was no uh, <coughs> distinction in terms of, there was no hierarchy and we were all uh, equal uh, colleagues. Uh, it was a department that it was a pleasure to be associated with, and I really did feel that whenever we had a meeting, uh, that uh, virtually everybody in the room was trying to think about what was best for the department, not what was best for their subfield or for themselves, but what was best for the 
department, and we naturally have different views of that, but uh, that people were committed uh, to that. Uh, we did have our idiosyncrasies. Uh, one was that whenever we were uh, hiring a new faculty member, uh, before considering that individual, we thought it necessary to talk for at least a half an hour as to what voting system uh, we would use in coming to our decision. And it was never the same voting, this voting system uh, in doing uh, that. Well, uh, part of my, uh, one of the uh, concepts I want to touch on is, is the part collegiality. And I think uh, we know that there's a vast uh, range, of a spectrum uh, for university departments. And as I said, I consider myself very lucky that I just happened to arrive in, in a department uh, like this. Uh, I especially appreciated it uh, because I had brief experience with two other uh, university departments. Uh, in 1967, uh, I took a position uh, at Michigan State University. And when I arrived there in 1967, I found that I was one of nine new faculty members in that department. It turned out that they had a little scandal a few years ago involving some covert CIA funding, and a number of people had left, which created uh, these vacancies, so a way that the outside world had impinged on my academic uh, career. Well, uh, here we were, nine uh, new young assistant professors. In the midst of the 60s, we were all imbued uh, with the ideology and ideals of the 60s, uh, and we found ourselves in a department with a very old school, uh, rather authoritarian head. And before I knew it, I was being drawn into covert meetings uh, where we were all sworn to secrecy because we felt that our careers were on the line if the head were to find out, uh, trying to see is there some way that we could uh, make some changes uh, and so on. So that was my introduction, my, my first position. Well, by the end of that year, uh, nine of us, of the nine newcomers, five of us uh, had left. So it was not such a happy uh, place. Uh, I was fortunate that I left uh, for a one-year visiting appointment uh, at uh, Cornell. And Cornell had been my undergraduate institution. It was a place uh, that I really loved uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. And so I was delighted to have the opportunity to go back, even though it was uh, just for the year. Uh, it was a great year until April of 1969. And in April of 1969, a group of African-American students, about 80 students, armed with rifles, took over the student union. This was one of the most serious incidents in a whole long uh, train of incidents uh, at universities during the 1960s. Uh, the campus ground to a halt. It was in crisis for about a week. Uh, there were demands on the parts of the students. There were very divergent uh, perspectives uh, on the faculty uh, what to do. Well, uh, for me, this was a very uh, disappointing experience because I had looked up to many of the people in the uh, government department where I had studied. Uh, and I felt that people in that department and across the university uh, had not acquitted themselves uh, very well. And that is, by that I meant not so much what position they took, uh, but the fact that they uh, did not practice the, you know, the ideals of, of, of scholars in, in terms of uh, trying to keep an open mind, uh, trying to gather evidence trying to understand uh, where someone who had a different view was coming from and why they had that view, uh, and to recognize that people could differ uh, somewhat over tactics, but still have a common commitment to the same uh, principles. Uh, and I didn't see a lot of that. I didn't see a lot of good sense uh, and wisdom. I saw a department that fractured, that people who had been close friends and colleagues stopped talking to one another. And one of, what was going on for me was typified by 
uh, one uh, prominent political scientist, the theorist by the name of Alan Bloom, who at one point in the crisis walked up to a colleague and said, I'm not going to speak to you ever again. You're morally contemptible. And in truth, they never spoke to each other again. Ironically, uh, Alan Bloom went on to some fame in the 1980s. He wrote a book uh, called The Closing of the American Mind, which was <laughs> declining uh, dogmatism in the American university. So it wasn't a confession or a, a, a taking back of what he had done. Uh, it was a case of not seeing himself in what he was uh, saying. So that is all by way of a very long preamble to say how lucky I consider myself to have, by the luck of the academic lottery, to have wound up at, at UBC. All right, well, what I'd like to do today uh, is something a little different from the other talks that have, I've very much enjoyed and profited from uh, in this uh, series. Uh, I'm not going to really say much about my scholarly career as a criminologist. Uh, if you're really curious, you can ask me questions and so on, or uh, my contributions to the discipline or the university. What I'd like to do is step back and just reflect it, uh, uh, briefly about my time in the university. Like many of you in the room, uh, we've spent 40, 50 years in, associated with universities uh, as students, as faculty members, and now as uh, retirees, I, I'd like to sort of re reflect a little bit about uh, that experience, say something about uh, my academic journey, uh, why it was I became an academic, uh, what my expectations were, uh, what I encountered, and how my thinking uh, changed. Well, the subtitle of the talk is uh, uh, the unanticipated education of an idealist, so that gives it away a little bit, so you won't be on the edge of your seats. Although, uh, when I came in, I was chatting with someone, and she asked, uh, do you consider yourself an idealist? And I had to stop and think. I know I've moved, uh, and I guess on reflection, I'd say, no, I'm more a realist now, although I'd like to think that some of the ideals have still uh, been with me. Uh, second thing I'll do differently, as you can see, and I hope it's not too radical, a break with uh, practices. Uh, there won't be any PowerPoint. Uh, so, uh, and uh, one of the advantages of that is I'll spare you and myself of the embarrassing uh, pictures I have of me uh, marching sort of lockstep with my generation. Uh, and in the 1950s, I had a crew cut uh, and uh, white uh, button-down shirt. Uh, and a few years later in the 60s, a lovely picture of me with the hair like that, long mutton chop sideburns and bell-bottom trousers. So uh, we all are, I think, you know, in a sort of temporal stream and, and sometimes uh, we don't appreciate just how much it affects me, affects us and, and how much our views are shaped by those kinds of uh, experience. Well, I've called the talk Universities in the Search for Truth. and. Doing so, I'm certainly well aware uh, that the concept of truth itself is, is under attack. Uh, but I'm just using that as a convenient shorthand uh, for uh, what my term well-grounded knowledge. And in terms of well-grounded knowledge, what I mean is knowledge with two characteristics. One, that it attempts to align uh, itself to take into account relevant evidence for and against the proposition. And secondly, uh, knowledge that's likely to stand the test of time, that is not just a product of momentary fads uh, and fashions. Well, my argument is a rather unexceptional one on this score. I believe that universities have much to be proud of, uh, that we serve society well uh, by passing on uh, accumulated knowledge, and by promoting the discovery of valuable new knowledge. I, th I think uh, universities uh, occupy a unique place in society. It's a place that we can be proud of. But on the other hand, I think that there is much uh, that we can do uh, better, and especially when it comes to controversial and highly charged uh, questions. It seems to me as scholars, uh, we often don't 
practice what we preach, especially when controversy uh, is present. We aren't as open-minded as we imagine. We don't accord the evidence uh, as much weight as we should, especially when the evidence doesn't uh, tends to conflict with some of our beliefs. Uh, and we're too hesitant to admit that we are wrong and to revise our views. And again, I'm not saying that we're failures or imposters, uh, but simply, as we're fond of telling our students, uh, we can do better uh, with controversial issues. <coughs> well, Winston Churchill uh, stated uh, part of this, I think, very well. He said, quote, people occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had ever happened. <laughs> and I think scholars, especially in the social sciences, uh, you know, might be guilty uh, of that. Well, since this is meant to be a talk in which I reflect upon my career, I'll, I'll be autobiographical. Uh, why was it that I became an academic? Uh, what were my goals and expectations? Well, I think there were uh, three major factors. One was the personal, one was the influence of my family, and one was clearly the influence of society. I was born in 1941, and it meant I came of age in the 1950s in the US, in, in New York City. Uh, and this was a period now turned McCarthyism. Uh, it was a time of intense uh, uh, fear of communism and of the Soviet Union and condemnation of the Soviet uh, system. Well, the experience of growing up in the 50s was magnified for me uh, because I, uh, my parents were very political uh, and they also were a strongly left-leaning uh, at that time. They considered themselves uh, socialists. Uh, they still saw the Soviet Union in a favorable light. Uh, they, at the very least in the 1930s, were what we call fellow travelers, that is being highly sympathetic to uh, the Soviet Union. They might have even been members of the Communist Party. I actually never wanted to ask them that, although lately I've become curious and I have thought that I might use freedom of information and see whether the FBI can elucidate that uh, for me. Uh, but anyway, uh, they were certainly very left-leaning and they were very much opposed to the prevailing anti-communism. The uh, formative period for my parents had been uh, the 1930s, the time of the Great Depression. Uh, it was a time, of course, as we all know, of mass unemployment. And if you just looked around you, uh, you had to conclude that capitalism wasn't working very well. It was also a time of gathering war clouds when the, the world was marching to the abyss of a new world war and people who were politically conscious could see this and were very frustrated that it seemed uh, that the major powers were doing nothing to avoid this and in fact were even abetting it through the policy of appeasement. Well, at that time, the Soviet Union was of course shrouded in mystery. It was hard to get uh, reliable uh, information. The Soviet Union was claiming to be, build a socialist state uh, claiming to provide full employment to its people uh, and was uh, actively denouncing uh, fascism, at least uh, until August of 1939. Well, as a teenager, I was trying to make sense of my world and I found it rather confusing. On the one hand, in school, on television, politicians uh, were stridently anti-communist. On the other hand, the picture I was getting at, at home uh, was uh, just the opposite. Uh, what was I to believe? Was the Soviet Union a totalitarian gulag, a worker's paradise, or, or something uh, in between? It was also uh, it was a time when communists, American communists were portrayed by J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, and others uh, as uh, scheming, uh, treacherous people, a fifth column, uh, who were doing all they could to destroy uh, the country, much like, very similar to the way Trump describes Democrats these days. Uh, so 
Uh, this was what, what I was getting from outside the home. Uh, in my home, my parents would invite friends uh, who uh, either were or had been communists. And I remember quite vividly a man named Ben Barron. Uh, he was gentle, quiet, almost meek. Uh, and uh, he had lost his job as a school teacher because of his communist affiliations. He now supported himself and his family by selling office supplies and he in no way uh, conformed to the uh, image uh, that the media was uh, pre uh, presenting. It was also a time when I could see myself that the United States was not living up to its ideals, uh, the McCarthyite repression. Uh, my father was a high school uh, science teacher. Uh, because of his associations and past, he was afraid of losing uh, his job. I can imagine, you know, him as happened to many people being called up to testify by the House on American Activities Committee, asked uh, to name names. Uh, and I'm quite confident he would have refused, and that would have been the end of his teaching career. So in the 1950s, he and my mother started a small business uh, on the side, and this was their insurance policy in case he lost uh, his job. He had a number of works, uh, you know, socialist literature, including Das Kapital, and he decided, given the times, it was much better to banish those books to a dark corner of my grandfather's basement uh, rather than to have them uh, in uh, the home. And I remember myself as a second year university student circulating a petition uh, protesting against housing discrimination against African Americans, uh, and this was a petition signed by people or sponsored by people like Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King. And going with this uh, petition to friends uh, who I knew shared my views, and almost without exception, I said, I'm sorry, Paul, I just can't sign it. I know that what's happened to other people who signed things in the 1930s or joined groups uh, that sounded uh, uh, very innocent and it came back to haunt them and to destroy their careers. Uh, so I could see myself, uh, uh, you know, the shortcomings of society. Well, uh, I was wanted to figure out myself then what was really going on in the Soviet Union. What kind of society uh, was that? And also, what were the appropriate policies for the West in dealing with that? There was an active debate in the 50s and 60s uh, should was peaceful coexistence between two opposed uh, social and economic systems, was that even possible? Uh, or did it really just constitute a form of appeasement which would make war uh, more likely? So these questions were very much on my mind. Nonetheless, when I uh, started university, uh, I actually started as uh, a science major, and this was because uh, my father was passionate about science, that rubbed off on me, and I thought that I wanted uh, to be uh, a scientist. However, once I got to university, I found uh, by second year uh, that whatever talents I had, they did not lie in physics, and I should find something else. And at that time, uh, I switched uh, to uh, study of politics, and in particular, the study of Soviet politics and the study of uh, uh, a foreign policy towards uh, the Soviet Union. Well, one reason I was attracted to a career in the university was that it seemed to me to be an ideal career. It would be a career, it, it, it felt to me, and I certainly felt this as a graduate student, and, and once I started uh, uh, here at UBC, uh, that it was an ideal career. <coughs> I would be getting paid to read the things I wanted to read anyway, to answer the questions I wanted to answer. What, what could be better uh, than to uh, do that? And I really wanted to uh, steep myself in it because I, these were complex questions uh, and uh, I knew that there were no uh, immediately apparent answers. It's clear as I look back, there were other influences as well and certainly uh, my parents uh, very much uh, uh, sort of valued uh, a university education. 
Uh, my father himself, because he finished university in the Depression, was not able to go on with his education and always wished he had had the opportunity to be at a university. Uh, and so that was part of uh, their uh, great esteem for the university. There also was a kind of set of enlightenment values that they saw knowledge and especially science as a force for progress and liberation of, of humanity uh, and for good uh, and, and, and to combat superstition. And so that was uh, an element uh, as well. And I think there also was a part of their sort of anti-materialism, their objection to the rampant consumerism of American society, that they saw university teaching, which at that time was not terribly uh, well paid, uh, as a kind of calling, as something you did out of service to society. And so uh, I uh, took, uh, uh, I, I think I imbibed uh, a lot of those ideals and expectations, and hence the subtitle, uh, the idealist and my unanticipated uh, education as to how things were a little bit more complicated as they always are uh, in uh, life. Well, uh, I gradually uh, came to, to realize, and you know, I, I assume most of you were probably more realistic and better grounded uh, than I was, that universities were human institutions, and like all human institutions, they had their imperfections. Uh, Immanuel Kant put it well when he said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. <laughs> and so I think that's realism. It's a fact of life. And I say, again, uh, we have uh, much to be proud of in terms of what we do. And also, I think there are areas uh, where we can uh, do uh, better. One, decide a couple of examples from my career where I would get frustrated is I thought that many people really wanted to see the world simpler than it was. I came to the conclusion about the Soviet Union, and one thing that helped me, I was very fortunate in that after my second year of university, I was able to go with a student group uh, to the Soviet Union uh, there were a group of about a dozen of us. Uh, one of the requirements was that you had to have several years of university Russian so that you could get along in Russian. And I got to spend uh, two months in Russia. Uh, and because we were young and because we stayed at camping sites, we had great opportunities despite the repression to meet with uh, Soviet citizens. And I was often really surprised that that they would be so candid uh, with us about the uh, system as they saw it, uh, knowing that if uh, what they said to us was reported, uh, that they could be arrested for that. They were very candid, and I think it was part, we were all in our early 20s. Uh, we all spoke uh, a rather fractured Russian, which I thought increased our credibility. We were not to live uh, by any means. Uh, and uh, they really did open up, and it gave me a sense of Soviet Union was a highly repressive society. It was much closer to what uh, you might read in the press than it was, uh, alas, to what my parents would have liked, uh, imagined it uh, to be. But I also became a believer that one could cooperate with the Soviet Union, that there were openings, that the system under Khrushchev was different than the system under Stalin, and that given the, the great danger of nuclear weapons, uh, that it was necessary to work for arms control. Well, the frustration I ran into from my perspective then having these views was of people who wanted the story too simple. Uh, this included people in the peace movement who uh, were working for better relations with the Soviet Union, which I certainly favored but did not want to acknowledge uh, the grave abuse of human rights that was taking place. They wanted to believe that Soviet society was a lot better than they were. it was. They found these two things uh, discordant, and therefore they, uh, they harmonized their views of domestic society to come uh, in harmony with their views of uh, foreign policy. Similarly, during the 60s and, and 70s, there was an active debate among scholars on the origins of the Cold War. And much of the scholarship was written by American 
uh, historians, so-called revisionist historians, who are challenging traditional views of American foreign policy. And I think they had a lot of very uh, useful things to say on that score. But here, too, they wanted the story and their reality simpler uh, than it was. Uh, and they tended to portray Soviet foreign policy uh, as being benign uh, and uh, unthreatening in a way I think that did not uh, accord uh, with the historical uh, record. Well, uh, so part of my uh, attraction to the academic world was to try to reconcile different uh, views uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, while I was growing up, I had one uh, early formative experience, which was somewhat painful at the time, but clearly very useful to me over the decades. And I would often recount this to, to my classes uh, on Soviet politics. Uh, it was when I was 15, uh, I believe it was June 1956, uh, one evening after dinner, I was in the living room and I was reading a book. My mother was on the couch reading a newspaper and I noticed uh, that she uh, was started to cry. And so I asked her, you know, what's the matter, Mom? And she explained, she was reading in the New York Times, uh, the speech that Khrushchev had given. Uh, this was in uh, February of 1956. Khrushchev gave a speech of several hours duration in which he for the first time laid out the extent of the repression, uh, the executions uh, under Stalin. Uh, it was called the secret speech because it was uh, given in a closed session of the party congress. It was not meant for the public. But the CIA, in one of its uh, few useful uh, achievements, <laughs> had obtained a copy of the speech it was published in June of 56 in the New York Times, if my memory serves me right, ran the whole thing. I don't know how many pages it was because of the speech of several hours. Well, she was reading the speech in which Khrushchev laid out in graphic uh, detail uh, just how bloody Stalin's rule was. And so for my mother, this was very painful to read uh, because she realized that things that she had believed <coughs> over the years, or things that she had argued or, or resisted uh, believing when people tried to tell her things, uh, that, uh, these, uh, that she was uh, wrong uh, on this. So what I took for, from this uh, is uh, an awareness that uh, certainty, a feeling uh, of certitude is by no means a guarantee that you've gotten things right. And in fact, I would argue that on the contrary, if a certain belief uh, bolsters your self-esteem, makes you feel more progressive and enlightened than other people, that's just a belief you should step back and scrutinize with extra care because you might be believing that uh, because of the way it makes you feel about yourself uh, more than it, because it's true uh, about the world. So that was a very salutary lesson for me. It made me uh, something, you know, made me very cautious in my commitment to political causes, maybe too cautious in certain instances, but I think as a, as a scholar, uh, it served me uh, well. Well, I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression uh, that my mother's epiphany uh, suddenly meant that I became a paragon of uh, self-awareness and uh, intellectual humility. Uh, in fact, there was a mu an amusing illustration uh, that this was not the case, that I was, uh, like many young people uh, throughout my university years, I thought I knew more than I did, and that the world was simpler and uh, less ambiguous uh, than it was. And the incident was, uh, in my last year of university, uh, when I had gotten accepted to graduate school, uh, I went to see one of uh, my mentors uh, to thank him uh, for uh, writing a letter of recommendation for me. Uh, and because he was a person who knew me fairly well, I had taken a year-long uh, seminar with him. Uh, I asked him if he had any advice uh, for me as I was 
heading off to graduate school. And he said something like, uh, well, you know, it seems to me that when we're reading uh, people that we disagree with, uh, it's a good idea uh, not to reject them too quickly and to try to understand where they're coming from and to consider their evidence. Uh, and even if you disagree with their main uh, thrust uh, of their argument, to think, are there some things that uh, you find that is useful? Well, thinking all of this was a bit general and a bit obvious, I said, yes, yes, but do you have any advice for me? And, <laughs> and, yeah, so, so he smiled and he said, you know, Paul, I wouldn't say that to everyone. <laughs> so, so anyway, gradually, I think it was a gradual process uh, I, of, of recognizing myself and recognizing that I was uh, prone to the same uh, mistakes as everybody. Well, at one point, uh, I, I may have been not until the 1990s, I came across some of the writing in Cognitive Psychology, uh, which talked about confirmation bias, things that were now, uh, of course, very much in the air, confirmation bias, motivated reasoning, uh, and so on. And one of uh, books, uh, explicating some of these ideas, which I found uh, especially valuable to me, it said a lot to me, was a, a book by a social psychologist, Thomas Gilovich, and it's called How We Know What Isn't So. And he explores just what our cognitive processes are. So uh, from then on, I would distribute to my classes at, at the beginning uh, several paragraphs from the book in an attempt to get them to think about what their own biases were, uh, to, to be a little bit self-aware, uh, more self-aware, and to be more self-critical. I tried very hard not to tell them what to think. Uh, uh, I didn't think that that was serving them well, and I worked really hard at just encouraging them to think, and from wherever they came on the political spectrum, whether it was left, right, or center, to question that, to, to see how their own biases might work. Well, let me, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll uh, quote uh, some passages from that. I think these are things we all know, at least in our moments of greater self-awareness and clarity. But I think we are, as human beings, in danger of forgetting, uh, especially when we're out uh, hunting for evidence uh, to support our favored uh, interpretation. So uh, I'll, I'll read uh, several passages. He, uh, he says, we humans seem to be <clears throat> extremely good at generating ideas, theories, and explanations that have the ring of plausibility. We may be relatively deficient, however, in evaluating and testing our ideas once they are formed. When examining evidence relevant to a given belief, people are inclined to see what they expect to see and to conclude what they expect to, expect to conclude. And then he gives a couple of more specific examples. I think we all can appreciate the general principle, but I think he has some uh, interesting examples. He says, people's preferences influence not only the kind of information they consider, but also the amount they examine. When the initial evidence supports our preferences, we are generally satisfied and terminate our search. When the initial evidence is hostile, however, we often dig deeper hoping to find more comforting information or to uncover reasons to believe that the original evidence was flawed. By taking advantage of optional stopping in this way, we dramatically increase our chances of finding satisfactory support for what we wish to be true. And then the last passage, our motivations influence our beliefs through the subtle ways we choose a comforting pattern from the fabric of evidence. One of the simplest and yet most powerful ways uh, we do so lies in how we frame the very questions we ask of the evidence. When we prefer to believe something, we may approach the relevant evidence by asking ourselves, what evidence is there to support this belief? If we prefer to believe that a political assassination was not the work of a lone gunman, 
we may ask ourselves about the evidence that supports a conspiracy theory. Note that this question is not unbiased. It directs our attention to supportive evidence and away from information that might conflict, uh, that might contradict the desired conclusion. Because it is almost always possible to uncover some supportive evidence, the asymmetrical way we frame the question makes us overly likely to become convinced of what we hope to be true. And I think this is especially relevant to the social sciences and that I've always thought that this is one area where the social sciences differ quite profoundly from at least physics, that in physics advances uh, by trying to uh, uh, negate, by looking for disconfirming evidence. Whereas in social sciences, it's almost impossible to uh, slay a theory with disconfirming evidence. People can always find uh, ways of reinterpreting and arguing it uh, away. And so the way we uh, proceed in the social sciences is generally by saying, OK, I think such and such hypothesis is likely true. What evidence can I find in support of that? And as Gilovich says, of course you can find lots of evidence. And yet we, I, I think, are bad at dealing with is the evidence uh, that uh, conflicts uh, with our, uh, our hypotheses. All right, well, let me uh, end, I, I guess, uh, with two quotes. Uh, one is from another book, which I uh, very much enjoy, and I'm, I'm surprised that it's not more widely read. Maybe the title scares people away. It's called uh, Being Wrong. Uh, and what it is is a, a, a lengthy discussion of just all the factors uh, that ensure that we're probably wrong about most of the things most of the time, although we as human beings, of course, convince ourselves uh, of uh, the opposite. We don't like to acknowledge how often uh, we are uh, wrong. And we seem to be very hesitant to admit it and to learn from that. And I think that's where the sciences, by the nature of what they deal with, uh, they, they have to move on from failed hypotheses much more quickly uh, than uh, in the social sciences. So the author of, of Being Wrong, uh, Catherine uh, Schultz, uh, who I, I think these days writes for the New Yorker, in one uh, passage she puts it this way, our tricky senses, our limited intellects, our fickle memories, the veil of emotions, the tug of allegiances, the complexity of the world around us, all this conspires to ensure that we get things wrong again and again. So I don't know if you want to say that to young people starting out on their academic career, but I think it is important uh, for those of us who have been through an academic career to, to, to sort of recognize uh, that's the key, the case, and that we're uh, going to get a lot uh, wrong. Well, I'll say uh, just two things, uh, I'll wind it up, uh, or maybe just one even uh, because of the time. And I think one of my favorite uh, sayings that, that uh, again and again came back to me is, is the saying, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, a page of history is, a tome, is worth a tome of logic. And we, in political scientists, especially criminologists, often uh, fell into the uh, uh, trap of trying to project what was coming ahead. People were very concerned about the future. What would it mean after Stalin's death? Or what would it mean when Khrushchev was replaced? Uh, what would this or that development uh, mean? And generally, we got it all uh, wrong. Uh, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, this was a shock uh, to all the entire community of Sovietologists, myself included. None of us uh, saw this coming. And similarly, I think as we realize now, we've been uh, commemorating the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, that when uh, the wall came down, when the Soviet Union uh, disappeared uh, as an entity, we all thought, or you know, dominant opinion thought, that we were entering a new period in, in uh, human development, uh, a, a non-ideological period, a period in which uh, democracy would be in the unchallenged ascendancy, and now we're seeing a mere 30 years later uh, that we're in the age of Trump, uh, of populism, of rising intolerance. Uh, and again, history has uh, uh, been 
uh, much more different than they imagined. So clearly, we need our, uh, you know, our uh, concepts. Uh, we need our uh, hypotheses. But I think we have to advance these with a certain degree of humility and, and know that, uh, you know, actual development of events is going to be uh, more complex and may go in directions that we did not in any uh, case anticipate. Okay, well, that uh, concludes what I want to say. I'm, I'm quite happy to entertain any questions or disagreements or objections that any of you might have.